Welcome to season six of the RAG podcast. Now, for those of you who don't know, the RAG stands for Recruitment Agency Growth. And this show has been around since early 2019. And every week, we are obsessed with finding out how the world's most successful and innovative recruitment agencies and their founders have got to where they are today. In season six, alongside the founder's story and the inside information of that business, I also want to focus on the reality of today's economy. There is so much noise about this inevitable recession that we find ourselves in right now. And where it's going to go, is it really having an impact on the recruitment sector? Are they seeing any change in job flow? Are they seeing any change in candidate control or activity? What is going on? I want to find out. So every single week, I want to forget the propaganda, forget the noise. I'm going to speak to a real life recruitment owner and find out what is going on in their business. I will bring it to you every single Wednesday from 12 o'clock across multiple platforms. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the RAG podcast. And on this week's show, I'm joined by an old client of mine, Matt Green. Matt is the founder and CEO of IDEX, a recruitment organization. I say recruitment organization, they're a recruitment. They've got a, an employer branding arm and an advisory arm to both the insurance uh, industries, the financial services sector, and now the legal sector. Born 17 years ago um, by Matt himself, the business now has 60 people. They've got a UK only presence, but they're dotted all over the, the country in Manchester, Birmingham, London, and Edinburgh and Glasgow, but they are a fully remote company. Um, what I love about this business is they've managed over the 17 years to do things the right way. They've built organically without investment. They've invested a lot into the business. They never took too much money away. And they've built a product with a genuine USP where they go into organizations, they sell retainers, they, they, they sell employer branding packages, and they genuinely can take recruiters from 200 grand working for another firm to join them and just literally be in their, have, have their services and their technology and their access and bill sometimes 1.5 or double, you know, what they were doing before. And as a result of all of this work, Matt is now on a mission to take the business from 10 million gross margin to 100 million gross margin. So 17 years in, they're at 10 million, they want to get to 100 million. But again, no pressure. There's no timeline. There's no like fixed. It has to be done by this date. Matt has a really long term view. So anyone listening to this episode, especially new founders or even people that are thinking about starting a recruitment firm, Matt's a really, really good person to to listen to because he's he's quite different to a lot of recruitment business owners. He's got patience. He sees the long term picture. He doesn't make rash decisions. He invests into his company and he sees it as as his baby. And and the way he explains how he's grown and how he plans to grow, I think so many people can take advice and, and learn from. So let's get into it. Without further ado, Matt, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thanks, Sean. It's good to be here. It's been many years since we've been uh, kind of working with each other, isn't it? So it's nice yeah. for this to come to a reality. When did we start talking about you being on the show? It was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, well, probably even five years ago when we first started working together, I think. So, yeah, so. and I was just launching the pod. So exactly. yeah, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a long one in the making, but I'm super excited to finally get you on. In the in your home office, which looks like a, a boardroom of some form, some kind of Ron, <laughs> Burg Ron Burgundy boardroom with a leather bound book. I love it. Great look. Um, do us a favor, Matt, for people who don't know you in the business, we're going to tell the story and go into detail after, but just give me the uh, the bird's eye view of your you and the business today in terms of what you do, the people you've got, the locations, headcount, that kind of stuff. Yeah, cool. Um, IDEX are um, a global recruiter now. So we specialize in three verticals, insurance, financial services, and legal. Um, each of those divisions is actually about the same size in, in our business. Um, there's about 60 of us, all based in the UK. Um, we are 95% perm recruiters. Um, and um, about 80% of the business is UK now. Um, with 20% being across Middle East, uh, America, uh, in fact, e everywhere at the moment. So we seem to be working, every, you know, client-wise, our clients take us all, all around the world these days at the moment in terms of the assignments we're mandated on. Amazing. So you say UK-based, is that, are you all over the UK? Is it, have yeah. you got a London presence? What's the landscape? Yeah, well, it's funny. I, I think uh, one, of our one of our colleagues posted um, 
back in when was it it would have been about may 2020 she posted that we've just opened up 30 new offices across the uk when everyone moved to home and uh, to working working for home but we've always had offices across the uk and we've now got physical locations in in london birmingham, birmingham um, manchester glasgow and edinburgh uh, that we use as, as actual locations where people can come into the offices and work together as, as a team amazing love it so IDEX is your business. Before recruitment, you were in the insurance world, weren't you? You were an actual insurance doing research. Yeah. Yeah. So how long did you do that and why did you make the change? I, uh, I fell into insurance because my best mate challenged me to go for an interview. Um, and he said, let's both go for the interview and the best man will get the job. So I, I didn't really even want the job, but I went along and somehow I managed to beat Terry to the job. And I, I got into insurance when I was about 17. Um, and it was, we were, I think it was 16 and we were deciding whether I wanted to do A-levels or not. So we, we did A-levels in the end um, and I used insurance as a weekend job. And then uh, I went off to university. That didn't work out very well because um, I'm not particularly studious. I just like grafting and uh, making money. Um, and um, but at the same time, while at uni, I stayed in insurance. Really, so I still had a full time job in insurance brokers down in Coventry while I was supposed to be st supposed to be studying um, and a bar job. So I don't know where I thought the study would actually ever get done. Um, but yeah, so I worked in insurance there for probably from 16 to about 21, 22. Um, and then the usual story, I went to a recruiter to find me a better, even better job in insurance sales. And then um, they lured me in. And well, there's looked. actually quite a similar, there's quite a lot of crossovers between insurance broking and recruitment, right? It's not worlds yeah. apart. Relationships, it's all about yeah. people. Uh, insurance, insurance has got a re an interesting reputation. You know, it's, it seems like a boring subject is insurance. People go, that's boring. It's one of the most exciting markets. In fact, I'll probably say it is the most exciting market I've ever recruited in because it's all about relationships. It's all about doing deals. It's all about transacting with other individuals. Um, it, as a young man, when I, when I was in the market, it, it was all about um, being in the pubs and the wine bars and, well, you know, the London market. Know, know, yeah. um, you know, it was just absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant time, really. We used um, to call it, like, London's best kept secret, the Lloyd's Market, like, because unless you're in it, you don't really know it exists. Like, when I used to talk about it to my mates on the weekend, and, and I, I recruited it, right? I recruited mm -hmm. professionals into it. You know, they were like, what? On a Monday afternoon, they're, they're, they're <laughs> drinking. I was like, yeah, about 11 o'clock on a Monday, they start drinking, and they finish about 4 o'clock on a Friday, and it's kind of the job. It's like, they, they do that, mm -hmm. and they make a fortune, these guys. They, you know, they do some really, really big deals. Um, mm -hmm. So you never, you never actually worked in that kind of Lloyds of London stuff, right? No, not at all. I worked in the regional markets, um, so so I never really got those glory days. But I think that the, I got attached to those glory days once I transferred into insurance recruitment and then got access to that that world. Um, so that is, was that what you recruited then? Was it yourself? Was it brokers you recruited? Or? Yeah, I started with claims handlers, two yeah. grand fees. So I think my best year was second or third year. I did two hundred and twenty two hundred and twenty grand worth of fees, but I think my average fee was about two thousand one hundred. So, so a, a, a lot of a lot of work. So a lot of a lot of work without internet to help. <laughs> so it, yeah. So I remember my wife and my mother-in-law stuffing envelopes on Sunday Sunday day Sunday daytime, you know, putting mail shots together and stuff like that. So it was just a complete volume play back then. But that was in the claims handling world. And then obviously you start to get smarter and you start to realise what on earth? Why on earth am I? Yeah you know working at such a low fee and you know if i can keep the same work ethic up but get my average fee up to 10 grand then crikey you know Changes got everything. a million pound so so when you when you were in because you started the business was it 17 years ago right so you mm -hmm. did in late 20s what was the so the through your 20s you worked for other people how did your how did your career trajectory go i don't want to go into massive details on this but did you yeah. Did you stay as a as a contributor, an individual builder? Did you become a team lead, management? What? Where, how did you? How did your trajectory go? I, I guess I was quite fortunate because I started as an insurance recruiter, having come from insurance. So I had a lot of mates that I knew in the market already, and so my first few months, which because um, I started at Hayes and it was a real hire and fire scenario back then. You know, I think 35, 36 of us joined in the first induction. 
by the second month it was down to about 22 third month for the training course it turned up it was down to about 12 and i think that by the end of the six months there's like eight people left yeah, yeah. you know and you felt like you were a navy seal because you've gone, <laughs> gone through buds it was amazing it was absolutely amazing yeah. so, so but i was fortunate because i was able to utilize the connections i've got and make money out of those while i was at le earning or learning the kind of learning the, learning the ropes um so I, I was able to become what recognized as a top producer quite quickly over the first couple of years and that then moved me into management right. um, i went down to bristol did a secondment down there and helped them to rebuild the bristol office came back to birmingham um and uh, there wasn't really a place for me in birmingham and so that's when i was about to set up idex and that would have been 2003 so um my wife and i had a choice we either had our first child or I set up a business um so I, I, won, I won the conversation and we went, we were about to set up the business. Um, and then I was headhunted by Reed and right. Reed got a bit of a distressed Midlands operation and their strength was financial services. Mine was insurance. So, so the, so I, and I looked at it and I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to understand how another successful recruitment business operates, yeah. take those learns, have our first baby. And then in a few years time, then go, you know, then start up the business. And so that's, so I became an area director for Reed and did, um, we took that from about 400,000 to 2.1 million in three years. Wow. So it was a bit, of, it was great learning, really proved to myself that I knew what I was doing, if you like, rather yeah. than just winging yeah. it. Um, but what obviously what I then did is I actually created a bit of a beast that I had to compete against then, which was a bit, you know. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. All in all, in all it was worth it. Was Where worth did you think the foresight and the maturity comes in at that age? Because you, like you say, mid twenties, to think I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to go and learn from someone else. Like I, I think I had a bit of that, but maybe not quite as early as you. Where, where do you think that comes from? I think you know. I think to be fair, it's probably more just opportunity really rather than a than a, a well thought out plan i didn't go looking right. for that opportunity yeah, so it was yeah. there so i think that often and i think this is a theme when i think back to how our idex has been successful is that when opportunity comes along the lucky people spot it and do something about it but a lot of people just don't do anything with it because because the, they're either not concentrating they're not looking you know and they've not got the radar the radar on so i think but also you've got a lot of people have got their plan of what they want to do and they've become quite fixated on that plan and then when change happens it really messes them their ability up to perform or to be able to succeed whereas as soon as change happens for me i find that as that's instantly exciting i think brilliant you know even if it's bad change you know even if it's a pandemic or a recession or whatever it might be that we've been been through it's like brilliant okay this is gonna this is gonna really mess up a number of people so that's this is our opportunity to, to to get a bit of a market opportunity a market gain and i think when so when the read thing came up it just was kind of clicked into place and yeah and uh, also made me have the opportunity to make mrs green happy as well oh, I bet, um, I bet. so it's a, so it a win a win win trying to trying to have a baby as well i'm having my first child now right in in a few months and it i've got two step kids which i think helps because i kind of I can kind of see that I've, I've had two years of being a stepfather and of, you know, my life is about children as opposed to just being all about me, which it was two years ago. And I can kind of imagine how they're going to evolve, right? I can see a bit of the future, but still have no idea what the first few months are like and being a newborn. And But imagine doing, I imagine doing this now at the early days of Hoxo and I just don't know if I could manage it, right? My brain was so consumed by the business. And I'm, yeah. I still am. I still am. I'm still. I still. I'm, I love it. I'm so fulfilled by thinking about it all day that sometimes my wife's looking at me like, "Why do you care so much?" I'm like, "I just love it. I can't really describe it." But well, it is yeah. like a baby. it is like a child, isn't it? It is, totally. it is your baby. It is your baby, isn't it? You know, it's the same thing. You know, yeah. you said we're 17 years old. I genuinely feel like we are a 17 year old person as yeah. a business. And actually, when you look at the maturity of the business, it's quite comical. We almost we, we we're a teenager at the moment. So, and we're on the way to becoming an adult and that's pretty much how we see the business. And it's, it's unbelievable when you actually put the parallels in, in, in place, actually. And when you look back at your early days of infancy, it really is infancy. <laughs> it? It really, if I look at our early days, I'm like, wow. I'm Two year old right. toddlers running around with, you know, being called managing director of a business. It was, it was hilarious. Yeah. I'm embarrassed by some of my early shit. But no, I think, I think, I think what I, what I wanted to say is going back to why I wanted to set my own business up, I think at the time, 
it, it actually came from a Hayes training course that they did in the first six months. Right. And, and it was a, um, a speakers international training course. And we had this most amazing trainer that came in and did a whole day. It was only a day, but the stuff I learned on that day is literally just with seeds planted for the rest of my for the rest of my career. And, and the massive one was, you know, taking, you know, setting goals and taking control of your destiny ultimately. And so I knew from very early, in literally within the first year of the Hayes, I knew that this is brilliant. I absolutely love recruitment. I love what I do. I love helping my clients. I love helping my candidates. Um, I love working with the team and getting them to be more successful because I'd start to kind of mentor somebody. And I thought, I absolutely love this. And I can easily make this my own. And, and um, you know, it wasn't about taking 100% of the money, which I think sometimes is a driver for people in recruitment to set their own businesses up. It was about actually these big companies don't look after candidates. They don't care about candidates. They don't care about clients. They don't really, unfortunately, a lot of them don't really care authentically about their colleagues. So it's just a machine to make money for shareholders or for large families or whatever. So, and I, and I knew that the magic ingredient of genuinely caring for those three pe- groups yeah. and wanting to make those people successful was just a, such an easy recipe to be able to build a business off the back of and an enjoyable one because it's, yeah you know, you're doing the right thing. I agree. When it comes to starting then, so where was, take us back to that journey of the early days and where did you come up with the name for a start? Well, we were called GI Resource Management at the start. Um, General Insurance Resource Insurance Resource Management. Um, I sat in a pub in Inverness with my brother-in-law with lots of whiskey trying to work out a name um, for for a business. And we came up with some brilliantly wacky ones, but as you will know, every time you find a name, you go onto the internet and you, somebody else has already got it or yeah. the website's not there or whatever. So GI Resource Management is probably the most boring name I could have ever thought of, but uh, we, you know, I think we ran out of, ran out of whiskey. Um, when you say we, was it just you or was there a partner at that point? No, it was just me um, at the time. Um, so um, Tony Bates and Dave Carr, who were my main business partners, they I always wanted to be in business with them. So we always had an ambition to be working together, but the time in their lives wasn't right. You know, Was that because you'd worked at Hayes together? Uh, I'd worked at Hayes with Dave Carr and I'd worked to lead with Tony Bates. Right, okay, right. Um, oh, that's cool. And, um, but yeah, was, but they, they were a few years younger and it just the timing wasn't right, quite right for them. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, the IDEX came around off the back of when Tony Bates came into the business, then we set up the financial services division. And then you realize ah, yeah. GI is not very clever, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we needed a more generic kind of uh, non-divisional name and, that, and IDEX was identifying um, expertise. All right, I like it, cool. So take us back to the early days when it was just you in GI resource management, what was the first version of the business like where were you based what how did you set it up uh, we were based above a funeral directors in wolverhampton um, and, um, <laughs> Those were the early days though. yeah and there was a green grocers underneath as well and um, green grocers and funeral directors and then us above in a hot sweaty room um it was just myself but my sister had just come back from traveling she was six years younger than me she'd just come right. back from finished uni gone traveling came back and so Natalie came and came on board and helped me. The initial idea was just to help me for a few months, just with some of the admin and just to kind of help me not go mad by being in a room by myself all the time. Um, and um, but Natalie stayed with us for about five years and became one of our top performers before she went back up to Yorkshire. Um, so um, so it was me and Natalie. Um, we won a contract with Wesleyan, um, which we pitched pitched against three of our main national competitors. Um, for a project that was worth about 90,000 and we won it and we could not believe we won it. Yeah. Um, and uh, we may have been a bit poetic with the back office support team that we got. Um, <laughs> uh, and it wasn't a complete lie, but I think we said we got five resources that would be working on the project. And that was my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, my sister-in-law and my mum and dad. Um, so, But they did genuinely help. So right. You got them on the phone? Oh yeah, my wife was doing telephone pre-regs and stuff like that for, wow. for you know while well, she's a green family establishment. It, it, it was hilarious. Yeah, it was hilarious. But Louise is the the opposite of uh, of a recruiter, really, uh, and uh, she just loved everyone she spoke to. So she had she just is such a lovely person. Yeah, but could, can they sell? It doesn't matter. They're lovely. Get, put them forward to interviews. Oh, can they do the job? That's the point. It's not friendship. Yes. Um, so the, how long were you in that? sweaty room with you and your sister for how long did that last 
Uh, again, another lesson we learned, we got a five year lease um, for an office that would hold six people. And um, after about 15 months, we, um, we'd got five of us in the business and, and the room was too hot yeah. and too full. Um, so I think within two years, we'd moved offices, we'd moved offices to a trading estate in Tipton. If wow. anyone knows Tipton, they'll know that that's again, not the most salubrious place to work. So, but you know, all, all you needed is a room where you could get people together. And we, and we, in that office there, we grew to about 16 people back then, back then in, in quite in a, on the outskirts of Birmingham, really in quite rough areas. Um, and then eventually we moved into the city center when we became I don't know, probably about five years old, something like that. Are you spending hours on LinkedIn and cold outreach and want more business coming to you over your competition? Well, if you're the founder or leader of a recruitment agency, here's what we can do for you. At Hoxo, we'll give you the training, support and resources to take you from what I call an offline recruiter, reliant on posting jobs and sending in mails to open up new customers, ultimately looking like every other recruiter on LinkedIn, to being an online recruiter, being seen by over 25,000 relevant people, driving a 200% minimum increase in engagement on your profile and seeing daily lead lists from LinkedIn that you can follow up with in six weeks time. And if you don't perform, you don't pay. Now. Why can we make such a bold, results-driven promise like this? Well, it's simple. There's two reasons. Firstly, whilst I've been building the RAG podcast, we've actually done what we say we'll do for our clients. In less than two years, we actually built a business generating from zero to over one million views per month on LinkedIn, leading to multi-million pound revenues with a sales team of me plus two people without making a single outbound cold call. Second is our track record. Not only have we done it ourselves, but we've helped over 350 agencies and over 4,000 consultants do it as well, it all in the last three years. Now, if that sounds of interest to you, click the link associated to this episode and we can book a call and tell you how we can help. Right, let's get back to the show. When it came to building the business, what in the early days, I imagine you did everything, right? Everyone does. Where, 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 at what point does your role need to change through that growth of say up to 10 because look majority of our industry never gets past 10 it just doesn't happen right and i i, I think i know why but what why do you think or why do you think you got through that 10 in in a few years and what did you need to do personally to ensure that happens bringing in leaders um ultimately so so i think um I think the recipe for our success has been by bringing in other leaders and sharing the equity, being prepared to share the equity. Um, so, you know, I was 100% owner of the business and then I own about 65% of the business. So, you know, an FD of mine at Reed, I think it was, he used to say, you're better off owning 65% of a 10 million pound business rather than 100% of a 1 million pound business. Um, and that stuck with me. So, so um, and so, so yeah. I think bringing in other le other leaders rather than bringing in just recruiters. So you need you need obviously at that age at that stage you need billing managers, don't you? You need player managers. So yeah. you don't want operational leaders, um, which do a fantastic job when the business is at a certain sc scale. But if you're ten people, you need people who are going to put meat on the table as well. But that can that build. Tony and, is that Tony and Dave then for you? Absolutely, yeah. At what yeah. stage did you get them involved? Tony came in after two years, and Dave came in. Dave came in after about um, six years, something like that. Um, and those were the catalysts. I think. I think in in essence, to be able to. You become the bottleneck, don't you, as a business owner? If it's just yeah, you, if it's just you doing it all, and so that literally allowed us to treble the size of the business ultimately, because we've got three competent people who can build teams and build teams underneath them. Well, was one of you insurance, one financial services, one legal? Is that where that came from? Legal came a bit later. Legal came, um, uh, yeah, came a bit later. Um, came in about 2015, I think. With uh, again uh, bringing in another leader, John Turner, who's top right. top lad. Who again we knew from the Hayes days. Um, he'd been over in Australia, then he was over in Dubai, and then he was coming back to the UK, and he knew what we were up to, and said, "You know, I want to build legal for you." So again, it's about it's about bringing in the talent that, that have the ability to inspire a group of people underneath them. And what did you split 
what were you, Dave, and Tony splitting up then? How did that work? So, so Tony was financial services, and um, Dave was general insurance London. Right. And I was general insurance regions, if you like. Right, it was perfect then. And when you say gen financial services, how do you break that down? Because that's such a big space, isn't it? It is. And we're more pensions, employee benefits, wealth management, and a bit of investment. Um, so that's our kind of niche within the financial services. That, and what, so type of, what type of professionals within those areas? Um, IFA, you know, income producers, if you like, in those verticals and then that the highly technical people so salaries of over 60 to 70 thousand now um so people who actually drive opportunity within our clients it's right. quite co they're all commercial aren't they they're all the roles are commercial on both sides hmm. yeah. yeah yeah which i think gives you that bond and that similarity even though they're different markets there's a similarity to what you guys are doing so when you brought tony in then after a few years tell me what what, what did you notice change? Obviously, you got the two people and you can grow, but what, 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 what was there anything else that changed at that point? Well, at that point, the, the, the world's large, the globe, most cl deepest global recession hit um, in 2008, which is right. due to the middle of 2008 when Tony joined to set up the financial services practice. So, um, you know, fair play to Tony. You know, he, he walked away from a, you know, six figure job at Reed to, to come in to work for our business and put some cash on the table and come in and, and you know, do, do his own thing. And he knew, we knew the market was collapsing at that, at that point, but rather than bottle it and stay at Reed, he took the, he took, he took the leap. Although even somebody at Reed said, one of the senior people at Reed said to him, said, you do realize that you're putting your whole family at jeopardy and you've been irresponsible for your, to your children. And this, you know, the really hot Bruce all kind of trying to counter offer him, um, which I think worked out the work for the opposite for Tony. He was like, right, actually, do you know what? Yeah. The I, more you start that, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Tony came on board, but then poor old Tony, the first six months of picking up the phone to clients, clients were literally laughing saying, you're not seriously setting up an F a financial services recruitment business at the moment, are you? So, so, so it was a, it was a slower start than we expected. And actually, when I think back of FS, GI, London and legal, each of those, every time we launched those businesses, we had good people, really competent, really capable who would, would be able to fly in any, any reasonable market that just go boom. But each time we started, the markets or the, the traction we expected wasn't quite as good as what we wanted it to be. And, you know, nine months into each of those businesses, you thought, Oof, wow, OK, this isn't great. But because I knew the quality of the individuals and backed them, then you, I was able to put my arm around them and say, don't worry, we've got the capital, you know, we've got the savings there. What we, what we did in the early days, I think, which is probably another trigger for getting past the, you know, the million pound mark or the 10 people mark or whatever it might be, was... We left. I left majority the, the majority of the money that the business made in the business yep. as capital. So we never had that kind of stress. We, we cash flow management was really strong. So we made sure that we had a three year projection of cash flow, and so and we knew where our new hires were coming in. We knew how much that would impact the actual cash flow, and I could sit down with Tony and Dave and you know John on the legal side and say, look, don't worry, this is the cash balance we've got. Even if it takes you another six months. We're not going to be in any trouble whatsoever. So just keep doing the right things, and it'll and it'll click. Rather so than saying that, and you know you've got the money. How do you feel in that moment, and how do you make sure that you remain positive? I guess um, when you've had nothing, you know, going back to nothing where you were happy anyhow isn't the the biggest threat in the yeah. world. Um, I've always been quite relaxed um, about the fact that I'm prepared to, you know, gamble again and go again. Um, it's enjoyable, you know, it, it, it's enjoyable. And I think I've never, I remember talking, I won't say who it is, I remember talking to a, a guru in the recruitment industry who heads up one of these recruitment network type of things. And I said to him, I said, uh, I've been in this for five, six years. I'm really enjoying it, but I'm, I'm just really not motivated by having like a massive, like a massive house and a really loads of fast cars and a yacht and stuff like that. I said, how, how do you get motivated? You know, when things are tough and he goes, well, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I want a yacht. He said, I, I want a big, even bigger yacht when I've got my first, my first yacht. So it, frankly, if you're not motivated by getting a yacht, then I think you should just pack up now. And that was it. That was the advice. He walked off. I imagine but, you didn't sign up with them. 
well, no, well, no, we didn't. Well, I think I'm very similar to you. You know, I don't, I don't have any major physical, uh, like you know, material aspirations. I don't. I remember I've said this on the podcast before. I had a, I had a call with my co- coach, and and we're talking about like the future. And I talked about, we talked about a number that in you know is is financial freedom, right? That we're kind of striving for. And uh, I think I'm quite different to you. I think I'm from nothing, but I actually do fear losing it i do i think that's what drives me more than ambition i think it's fear of losing it i think i'm definitely driven by the fear of it all coming down i think that's what keeps me going every day um so we're talking about what is the number that makes you think that you know you it can't come down like, and you're okay at that point so i told him the number and then he goes all right cool tell me what your life's going to be like at that number and i painted this picture of my life and he starts laughing like proper laugh and i said well, it wasn't funny i thought like, what you're laughing at he goes i didn't expect that I said, well, why not? He goes, because I'm still waiting for the bit where you need the number that you told me you need. Because none of it, you, you've not mentioned anything about like yeah, money yeah. and cars. And he's like, you could do that. What you're saying, you could do now. And I was like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you're right. You're right. So, it, you know, I think that's healthy though. And, I, and we've done very similar. We put, you know, we kept all the money in the business pretty much. And mm. I think going into COVID, if we'd have hit COVID in 2019, we'd be gone. Mm. We'd have been gone. We just didn't have the cash reserves. We didn't have the business. And then a year later, we saved a lot in that 2019 to 2020 period. And that saved us. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's it. And I think that's it. I think if you, if, if it's a lifestyle business and you just want to extract the cash from the business, then that's fine, isn't it? And that's, I've got loads of mates that have run a business like that. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're not building anything of, of capital value as such. And that's their strategy. But, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, just to be, uh, I have done all right out of the journey now. You know, it's, it's turned into a nice, it has turned into a really nice scenario for my family. And we've got to the point where we've achieved the number the number that we were chasing. And so that's then changed the whole dynamic of um, my why of being in the, in the, in the business. Um, but yeah, but maybe before going on to that, going back to those early days, it was, it was very much, um, it was very much knowing that we had good people and backing them. And then knowing that they were backed and supported and never driving people for short-term income. As soon as you start doing that, whether it's a consultant or a leader or whoever it is, if you're trying to drive short-term income as your focus, you've really got the wrong strategy, in my opinion. Because yeah, you know, you're know you going to be doing that every quarter or every month, and it's a horrible way to live. You know, yeah. So you've, you've got to take some pain. You know, every In our growth of our business, we always end up with two decent years of growth and then a flat line where we right. put, where we kind of just take stock, kind of get ourselves together, regroup, and then we go again, we go again for a couple of you're a different years. business at that point than you were. The two years of growth it means you've got to like, absolutely, you you're not designed for that size and that scale. And then you need to re it makes complete sense. Well, the reason I asked that question before <laughs> about how do you stay positive? Is because mm. I think that's quite pertinent right now, right? Mm. I'd say most of our industry sat mm. on an absolute bag load of cash from the last two years, right? Unless yeah. they're absolutely, unless they've been flying around in private jets and stuff, the amount of money that's been generated in the recruitment industry for the last 18 months is astronomical, probably the best in history, right? Mm. Yet this, we're probably three, four, five months into a slowdown mm-hmm. it's for different industries at different levels. But the amount of people that are treating it like Armageddon, that are panicking, that are shutting all spend and letting people go and i'm just a bit like you're sat on so much money mm. yeah you, you do of course you don't want to be burning cash every month but where's the foresight where's the confidence where's the positivity that actually if you hold on to things if you ride this wave do you know what i mean do you see that absolutely yeah 100 uh, percent. so uh, so um again it's just that short-term view you know so uh, two out of three of our practice areas are still doing okay um, um, one of them, which financial services, always gets hit first by the economic kind of kind of world, and so they're still flying in comparison to where they were three years ago. But they're not flying as fast, and so and so you know, rather than we, we're all panicking, thinking, well, this is going to be dreadful. It's like no, no, this is just a moment in time again, as all, as always, you know. And actually, if you look at the stats, if you look at the data. The, the market hasn't fallen off the cliff. No, yeah. The market just returned to where it was, yeah. you know. And, and but because people and I think you look, at, I don't know if you saw the Robert Walters stuff that's been posted um, 
today, you know, when are we middle of June? So, so it's just been started and uh, just been posted and they, they've, um, their stock price has just fallen through the floor. Wow. But that's because they've obviously forecasted incorrectly. You know, when we, when we came, you know, when, you know, Christmas time, when you could see that it was starting to slow down, we knew that, we, you know, so what did we, we grew by the year 21, 22 coming out of the pandemic, we grew by 80%. The last year, 22, 23, we grew by 40%. Well, this year we projected that we might grow by twelve percent because we knew it was going yeah. backwards. So, so, and that's fine. There's no point in stressing about it. There's no point in worrying about it. There's no point in thinking that's a disappointing kind of result. Well, anyhow, for us, it's almost part of our normal two, two plus one steady cycle. Anyhow, so it kind of works works well for us. But when when the market goes bad, it's the time to start or or start or goes quieter. It's the time to position your next stage of growth yeah you know, that's when you've got the time you know that's what the pandemic was all about we realized that yeah, okay, we yeah. suddenly had a new commodity that i'd never had in 14 years of recruitment or 14 years of running my own business i suddenly found a new commodity which was time i'd never had it before i've never had the ability to sit in my room for three hours and nobody call or nobody hassle me or whatever and, and just to be able to think and you think right brilliant so i've got time now what do i do with it hmm. and so so yeah so so you're dead right but, but you know if the shareholder led businesses then obviously it's a different world isn't it you know but i think no, if you're an independent business and you've got that cash in the bank like you say then invest the cash for the next stage of growth don't yeah. worry about now as long as you as long as you're not you know it, going too deep into any reserves you've got. I mean, people still should be able to make profit now unless they've been really silly in terms of and frivolous over the last two years in, in kind of hiring, you know, non-income producers that can't add value. Um, then surely, you know, any consultant can still wash the face. You'd hope so. You'd hope so. When it comes to your business, Andy, you mentioned it briefly then. You, you, you kind of originally had a target or a number, something you were trying to hit that was kind of the, the original driving force. Tell us about that and, and when that was realised. Um, we never had a number, Sean. So so it, we never set out to grow a, a business of any size in particular. We, we set up the business to be able to produce a business that I was proud of, and that was my driver. Um, my dad told me when I moved into recruitment, so I moved into recruitment and I think I trebled my earnings um, in my second year in recruitment from what I was earning in insurance. And it was obscene. And my dad's a northerner and you know, I think I was earning quite a lot more than him by that point as well. And so I was really embarrassed. I didn't tell him. But somehow he found that he found he found out. Um, and uh, or he found out, I'd, I'd mentioned what a bonus I'd just picked up, yeah. and he was furious. He says, that's obscene. He says, I design drills that do this all over the world, and and all you do is send out some CVs, you know, and you're getting paid all this money. It's obscene. It's obscene. And he, and he basically said, you're parasites, recruiters. And I was like, oh, cheers, Dad. I, I, I'm quite proud of what I'm doing. Um, but what he said was really stuck with me, as, as you'd expect, because it's your old man say, saying it. Um, but what... It then made me just really think about, well, if I'm charging a fee, do I deserve that fee? And so I, I knew I could make a lot of success out of recruitment. I knew I could make a successful business. But the key driver was to be in a position where if a client pays me a 40 grand fee or we've got 150 grand fees, 200 grand fees coming through now, if someone's paying that fee, I want them to go, that was a brilliant investment. And that was genuinely our driver. That, that has always been our driver. And... We're just getting there now after 17 years of being able to realize that realize that dream because of technology and a bit because of scale as well and, and market market kind of presence in some of our in some of our markets. Um, so there was never a number. It was about actually changing the narrative on how a recruitment business is viewed. That was that was the goal. And then literally it's been because we've had the right values and vision and people buy into that people because it's authentic and it's packed you know and, it, and it's literally you cut me that's what that's what's inside me um then everybody has joined in because when people are joined in we never said right we need you to become a 500 grand biller or we want you to do this number we want you to come in we want you to achieve your life goals we want you to be really proud of what you do you know that's the, that's what we want you to come in and do 
Now, don't get me wrong. If you're not covering your costs, then you know yeah, you, you're, you're, not, you're not being fair to the business. But yeah. outside outside of that, we want you to we want you to we we set um, mutual goals each year, and we help them to achieve their personal goals. And they help us to, you know, they make sure that they bring in the number that they, they need to do to, to get a little bit of profit coming through. Um, so there was never a number, unfortunately. It, it'd be nice to say there was, and we, we smashed it because there, of this. What was there something in your head as a as an individual, like you say that, whether it be financial freedom or was there anything yeah. that you were? Yeah, yeah, fin- financial. So, so um, financial independence. So. Um, Again, my dad, I can't believe I'm talking about my dad so much today, but my dad worked in that profession where he was a, he designed pneumatic drills um, right. uh, for um, uh, large companies all over the world. But he stayed, well, he actually stayed at the same company for 30 years, which was a small Halifax company. And it grew and it grew and it grew and he got bought out by loads of different companies over the years. He stayed there as a manager. But 30 years, when he was about 53, uh, he got made redundant, just out, out of the blue, it just because they just changed the, changed the model. And it br- it really knocked him for six right, right. Um, because he ultimately that next seven years that's where he planned because all the family had moved out by that point that's where he planned to create the nest egg that he could retire on and live on and it was all taken away and it was really upsetting at the time because my superhero suddenly had the wind taken out of his sails and that was the driver so, so there was two drivers one was doing the right thing for the clients the candidates and the colleagues that was really passionate about knowing that the secret source was there that's all you had to do is focus on doing it right by those people but the other one was financial independence uh, of you know yeah so, so basically that i wasn't going to be at anybody else's you know, nobody else could interrupt my ability to give my family what i wanted um but again back then you know just the ability to pay the mortgage every month was you know and not be not be in a position where i wouldn't be able to be sacked by somebody else yeah um, that was that was the driver it wasn't right oh i want to get a million pounds sat in my bank account um it, that's all happened just off the back of the of just focusing on doing the right things um, makes sense makes sense so over the last three years there's been quite a lot going on and since the pandemic like you said, you had this time to, to re, re, reflect on where you were and where you wanted to be. So what, what's, how would you describe the business and what you've been trying to achieve since, since then? Um, well, the pandemic was another obviously massive opportunity, wasn't it? You know, and a massive um, change to the world. I think um, we always try. I, I went to a seminar and there was a futurologist. Have you heard of those? What a cool yeah, job yeah. that is! Futurologist. I tell you what, that, that's my next career if I, if I ever get, get another job. But a futurologist, and I thought, what a wonderful thought! You know, if that's your job is to predict the future, predict the future. Um, and that was about 10, 12 years ago. I remember saw this guy, maybe one of the recruitment expos or something like that. And uh, I thought, well, that's what we've got to be doing, isn't it? We've got to be constantly looking at the future and constantly working out where. The bounce, the balls, and the bounce next, or whatever you know, whatever cliche you want to use. And so, um, we knew there was a massive desire for working from home and that kind of agile environment. Um, we also knew we were really rubbish at training rookies because none of us have the patience in the business. Um, we've we've got some brilliant clients, we've got some brilliant. You know, relationships out there that can be capitalized on but you know the thought of bringing in rookies that kind of might make it in six months time and the client that how crap that is for the client's experience um when it doesn't work you know we've we kind of we, we've changed our philosophy to just recruiting adults that experienced adults that can come into a, come into our environment so because we knew we were recruiting experienced adults that, that didn't need that kind of handhold in an office we yeah. knew we could have an agile environment so back in April 2019 at our sales conference, we announced that we were going to have this strategy. That we were aspiring to have a, a plan where you can work wherever you want, when you want, wearing what you want. And that was our and that was our vision. Now it was a bold vision. One of our values is be courageous. That that was we were being courageous because to be quite honest, it terrified us. But often the things that terrify you are where you get your best returns, aren't they? Your best, best rewards. So we we set it out uh, as the mantra then, and we moved towards that goal. But then, of course, the pandemic came in, 
and meant that it just became a reality overnight almost. But what we'd done as our move towards that goal, um, which a bit fortunate really, was we'd got laptops for everybody, we'd got an ad complete agile working environment in terms of technology. We changed everything and geared everything so that we could, you know, once we suddenly, once we really pushed through and got enough courage to say, right, like, everyone just do what you want. Um, we had the infrastructure in place to do that. So we had all the dashboards from the Q, like Q19, Bullhorn. We had all the systems set up so that anybody could work anywhere in the world whenever they wanted, because that was our aspiration. So then when the pandemic hit, it was like, oh, ah, right. Okay, that's all right, isn't it? We can, we can deal with this. So bang, everybody's at home. Everyone's on Teams. We were using all the video interviewing stuff already. So we were kind of familiar with that world. Um, and we've got, like we were saying there, we, we weren't extracting all the cash from the business. So we've got a very healthy pipeline of cash. Um, and we turned around to the business and we said, look, you know, we're not furloughing anybody, you know, so we want to fight. We want to stay on the fight. We want everyone on the, on the pitch. There was a few back office people, actually, to be fair, that we, there wasn't going to be enough work for them to do. So we are like, look, you know, if you want to furlough, and, and so they furloughed. There's a couple of uh, parents that have got one-year-old child, children that just said, we can't, after two weeks of trying, they just said, we can't do it. Um, but the majority of the business stayed on the pitch and we and we took a, we took we took all of that time to invest into training people so we we, we bought in invest we bought in training for all the consultants on set and upskilling the sales we brought in a leadership coach to spend loads of time with all the leaders upskilling on the leadership side so basically capitalizing on that new commodity of time that that, yeah, yeah. that, that we had um and so the ability to kind of, uh, I think James Kahn gets quoted with this, doesn't he? With the observe the masses and do the opposite. We were in a position to do that, and uh, it worked. It worked because the market came back a lot faster than anybody expected, didn't it? Oh, you know? it was a, yeah, it was a mm. ridiculous. ridiculous and, yeah. And how how has the business evolved then? So since you made that investment, the market then picks up. How do you describe that eighteen months, two year period? I describe it as the most exciting time of my career. Um, yeah. Like, like you say, obviously the tide's risen, hasn't it? You know, the, the tide's risen, so it's been, you know, the, the yeah, utopia for recruiters. Um, but what's happened for us is that because we had the aspiration and the setup to work remotely, and the des leadership desire to do that, that's re transformed our business. Mm -hmm. So the collaborative nature of our business, because we had multi sites as well. Yeah. We're far much more joined up as a business than we were prior to the pandemic. Yeah. You know, albeit we've got 60 people working at home and dropping into an office whenever they want, um, which feels a bit like anarchy. We're actually more joined up. Or certainly you don't have that Birmingham culture and Manchester culture. It's Correct. Like we're yeah. the same. Like we went from being Bethnal Green, I think you knew mm -hmm. where we were based. You know, we've got 75% of our employees in South Africa. We've got Portuguese, we've got UK, and literally... We, yeah, we, we're all meet at the end of this month. We're going to South Africa to meet for the first time as a company. It's going to be amazing. Can't wait. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's time to put us all in a room. But actually, I don't think it's held us back. Like it really no. hasn't. And we have we work licenses in all these cities, and it, it just works, right? It just absolutely. Yeah, but absolutely. we've got a very similar mindset to you. We don't bring rookies in. They're all adults. They're all experienced to a degree. They're all comfortable with that setup from the day one. Like we're not, we're not trying to be. We're not trying to plead. Uh, if you're trying to be a, a training and company, then yeah, you've got to probably think about that. That's got it. But I, I don't need to worry about that. It sounds like you don't. No, like like likewise. But um, but yeah, no, it, it's um. So I think the fact that we we built what we call our platform for success. So the whole model was that we wanted a complete agile ability, so people could work anywhere in the world doing what they want when they want, and as long as they were doing what they need, servicing the clients, and you know. Achieving their achieving their plan and happy happy days, um, but we but the platform for success was also about trying to get somebody who was producing say one fifty one fifty two hundred at a competitor, so they were a reasonable recruiter, but trying to give them an ability to be able to turn by putting no more hours in, but basically just take one fifty to three hundred or two hundred to five hundred. Yeah. And so we want we so we create the platform. So we've invested loads into marketing. You'll be pleased to know. Yeah. Um, you know, we've built the team out to there's look like, four four people in the marketing team. We've got a marketing director who's ex Hayes, you know, 15 years. Um, she's phenomenal, and she's brought a really great team with her, a head of content, head of digital. So we we're very top heavy to be fair, but we've put some fantastic people who are going to build the team out underneath underneath them. So that team will treble over the next few next few years. 
Um, we've already got a good infrastructure of external suppliers that complement them as well. But marketing has been a massive focus in order to be able to help to bring an inbound flow of yeah. uh, opportunity into the com to the kind of fee earning population. Um, but then we've also got a data manager and she just looks at data and she looks at helping people to work smarter. So looking at the marginal gains, so telling people, look, you've worked on these hundred jobs, this type of job, you've not filled any of it, filled any of them, you know, or you've only filled one out of 20. So look, stop dealing with that focus on these eight, these 50 type of jobs that you were working on before and bang that person, they're all be they're an adult, they're a fantastic recruiter. You, they can't see the wood for the trees sometimes and so on. Oh, so you're right, you're right. Right. You? Absolutely. So so we've got now, over the last few years, we've brought people in who were doing 200 grand elsewhere, who are now doing 400, 500 grand in their first 18 months. Yeah. You know, and we've so the platform for success has now really come to really come to life. A message from our sponsor Vincere to announce their portal access. This is a quick win solution for agencies in need of a portal that their candidates and clients can use to access all the information they need through the job search. This is a no code solution. It's your one way ticket to attracting top candidates and getting clients to review everything in one place. So you can easily set up candidate and client and job portals within your Vincere account and you can configure it so it looks just like your recruitment agency brand and it feels like you've developed it yourself. In there, you can publish jobs so they go straight out onto your website with one click and you can offer candidates a place to look at those jobs and search for the next role. Your clients, you can give them a link and they get their own unique login and so they can access everything. They can look at all the CVs against the job and all the progress and development 24 seven. They can rate and review candidates and arrange interviews right there and then. This is all available now within Vincere. And if you're a RAG listener, you can always get an amazing deal with these guys. So click the link in the show notes and find out if you can use Vincere portals today. Two questions come from that. Like, first one is, how are you attracting them? Because that was something we talked about in the past, and it's it's the biggest challenge in our industry, right? It's how do you get a 200k villa to leave a firm and join a new firm when they're probably earning decent commission and they're they're on a decent trajectory? What what how, how have you managed it? What's been your secret to that? We've created some really unique IP in terms of how we deliver to our clients. Do you remember I said about that kind of journey of I want to transform the way recruitment's perceived? Yeah. Well, we've cracked it, you know, and we're now in a position where, um, so over the law firm yesterday, uh, global law firm yesterday, uh, really interesting guy, actually, fascinating, because my world's been insurance and I'm now kind of doing a bit, a bit in the legal side. The questions that this equity partner of this massive law firm asking me were phenomenal questions. I felt like I was battered when I walked out of there. But he um, he basically summarised it at the end. He says, so, he says, so you're... Are you more marketing than you are recruitment then? And I said, no, we're probably about 50-50. And so, 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 you know, doing the stuff that you've, you and I have talked about all over the years, helping clients with their EVP, helping clients to, to get that externalised as well and to warm talent pools up and create an inbound flow of talent. We've now invested in the technology, the systems, the marketing, and we can go out to market and credibly authentically sell that show dashboards of talent nurturing the stuff we've got is i'm so proud of it. it's absolutely immense and so what people are seeing when they come to talk to us first of all we got uh, we're getting an inbound flow because we're getting quality people in and so it's a bit like a rolling stone people are seeing like top performers leaving businesses and coming to idex so they're thinking well, hang on why are they going over there and so so in mill kind of connectivity suddenly flies up because everyone thinks, well, like, yeah, I've gone, I'll have a coffee with you. Yeah, and then yeah. when they have a coffee, we've got such a good sell in terms of the platform for success that we've got. It's so easy to digest, easy to understand. And people go, yeah, okay, I can see that with my current client base, with the current hours I'm putting in, I can double my, I can double my earnings. You know, our commission scheme is probably one of the leading commission schemes as well, but it always has been. That never helped us to crack that nut. I think what's helped us to crack the nut is having the ability to, to show with data, show with MI, show with the, show the material we do and the systems we do. And people are seeing, you know, we've got we've got the seven figure biller in the business now. Um, you know, so people we know how to get people to go from 250 to 500. You know, we've got that answer. And a lot of these 250, 200, 250 fee earners have kind of reached a bit of a ceiling in their current environment. Um, 
because the current environments don't have the right platform. Often they're, they're not really led by, you know, my, our, our leadership team are, are, are kind of, their one job is to be inspirational. That's it. So, so inspire people to do things that they, you know, so our, our, our strap line that we, through our reload, the rebrand was make the unbelievable achievable. So with somebody who comes into our business who thinks that they could potentially go from 250 to 350 and that'd be a really good result, we're like, right, that's great, but we'll get you to 500. And they don't believe it. And they don't believe it. And they come in and all of a sudden they're doing it. And they're like, oh my God, I can't it's, believe this. And we're changing forget, lives. Sean, it's quote, it. brilliant. I forget the quote. I don't know if it's a Warren Buffett or something, but it's about like, it's, it's the vehicle you're in as opposed to necessarily mm -hmm. how hard you work. Like, you can work really hard, but if you're in the wrong boat or the wrong car or the wrong vehicle, whereas what you've created is the vehicle, right? You've created the machine that people join and then they carry on with the same effort, but there's, there's such a better process, such a better, you know, USPs to the, you're actually giving genuine USPs that they don't exist mm -hmm. in the industry for most, mm -hmm. for most firms. Um, so take us on a journey for what you're trying to achieve now, because you've got some pretty bold ambitions yourself making the unbelievable achievable right yeah absolutely and, and i think that's the thing that you kind of we hold ourselves to account for this so we've got kind of our, our, our three kind of um uh, values are be courageous you know be innovative and, and be inspirational you know and so you kind of got to hold we, we hold ourselves to account for the for, to those things and making the unbelievable achievable so where that starts that starts in my head if you like you know so i've got to push myself up you know can't you can't just talk the talk. You've got to think, well, actually, right, come on and set, set the example from the top. So, so you know, at our conference back in, um, I think it was April, May, you know, we we launched the new goal, overarching goal, which is to take the business to 100 million. And we're currently at 10 million. So if we continue growing by 30% a year, for example, it's actually not that hard to get to 100 million. Yeah. Um, so, but so the target is to grow the business to 100 million over an undefined time timeline, which really upsets certain people because they say, "Well, that's rubbish. Surely you've got to make it a time bound. Otherwise, it's not a realistic goal." I'm like, "Well, we don't need to make it that time bound. The most important thing is that people on the journey are getting life changing opportunities, you know, and then it, when we will get to the 100 million because we're not worried about the 100 million it's just do the right things and and, and all and all the building blocks will all fall in place so we never set off to get to 10 million and we got here so 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 don't get me wrong we've got a plan we've got cash flow modeling we've got we've got organic growth plans we've got MA plans as well so we're looking at acquisitions in a number of different countries that we're looking we're looking at so we're building those out we won't do those I was gonna say, what 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 is your is your strategy to grow through m a then what what type of organizations are you looking for um complementary ones obviously but not ones that are already in our core markets so there's no point in paying for a business the cost of a business for uh, that, only, that deals with the current people we already deal with but if it's a, if it's a complementary marketplace or if it's a new geographic territory then those are the areas that we'll use acquisition instead of organic growth um so we're we'll building around your you'll give that business then your services that you so they'll take a Absolutely. traditional you wrap the service yeah. around you've got it so if we can take a 200 grand producer and get them to do 500 we can take a two million pound recruitment business and get it to five million yeah without the needing to find any more clients or recruit any more people so yeah, you know, that's very much how we're starting to look at the acquisition opportunities that are, that are out there. But that acquisition stuff won't probably, we're, build, we're building our, we're nurturing the kind of people that we're interested in. And I think that will happen probably in two to three years from now. That's not an immediate, it's not an immediate opportunity. Um, we've still got that kind of rebasing of the platform. Now we're, now we've doubled in size ultimately, or, you know, or more than doubled in size over the last two, two, three years. So we've just got a little bit of foot on the ball time, just making sure the infrastructure is correct. Getting the market, giving the marketing team time to get all the ducks in a row in terms of having now a larger platform and a lot more mouths to feed. Um, so, but yeah, we'll drive to, we'll drive the business to a hundred million. Um, the one thing that the so like I said, I, I've managed to tick the box that I wanted to in terms of getting myself to a point where um, I'm comfortable. And so then I've been working with my coach. You talked about your coach. I've been working with my coach to try and work out well, what's the point in doing any more. You know, yeah. where, where, what's the why, the old Simon Sinek stuff. 
I've gone through his book and I've done, you know, I find it very uncomfortable to be fair, but kind of going through that type of stuff and but really needing to find a why. And I couldn't find an authentic why because it's like, oh, I want to change the world or, you know, I don't want to change the world. I'm bothered about changing the world, really. I'd like to make the world a better place, as Michael said, yeah. but I'm, I'm not too worried. I'm not too worried about, I couldn't really pin a why on something grandiose. Um, and uh, then I, and the only thing I could really pin a why on was I just want the guy, the people that have helped me to get to where I am now, I want them all to create generational wealth. That's a good enough why for me. You know, no, so that's a great why. So how are you going to do that? Well, we're already doing it, to be fair. We've already got examples in the business where people are, are, are the unbelievable has become achieved, you know, and we've got EMI schemes in place. So there's opportunities for people to get equity. We're looking at uh, we're looking at various models like the employee owned trust. We're looking at, at management buying opportunities. We're looking at various different things. But ultimately, one of the reasons we've been successful is that we share the wealth. So the profit margin of our business is very low in comparison to where it should be. But it doesn't matter because we're not look, we haven't been looking at investors for acquisition. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong, we've got probably a little bit of justification to do there when we start to talk to people about actually, well, we want you to give us some money for this next stage of growth. But with the economy to scale that will come into play, hopefully we'll start to see the bottom line bottom line improving. Yeah. But because we've never been overly worried about the bottom line, because it's always about the kind of medium term plan, um, we've been able to share the wealth out. So the commission scheme has been gratuitous at certain points. You know, the generosity we think is brilliant, but it's because people, it's a meritocracy and people have deserved it. So that will continue. So it's a case of trying to get as much equity out to the, to the leadership team, to the people that are helping us to drive the business forward, sharing that wealth. So, you know, for the current leadership team, once we've got or the me, Tony and Dave, once we get to 30 million, that, that's job done in terms of our personal kind of um, number, if you, like, if, you, if you like. And then it's a case of right 30 to 100 is about giving the other leaders in the business and no doubt the people, the businesses that come into our group as well at that point, giving those people the opportunity to finish that journey and to create generation. Why is 30 million? Why is that for you, Dave and Tony? Like, how, how does that work? Um, I asked Dave what his number was. I asked Tony what his number was. And then we worked out, right, well, on that basis with this ratio that we need the number to be this valuation. Um, and that became the, fi the figure. There's no point in setting a number just for show. But at that valuation, you sell a percentage of the business to take money off the table. That yeah, we don't want to sell the business. Um, I'm 47. Um, I, I I don't really want to work for anybody else um, at any, any, any point going forward. So, so the optimum route for me and Dave and Tony is, is to create a management buy-in kind of vehicle. Yeah, yeah. yeah, where we might take some of our equity off the table during that venture that's funded by the banks and funded by onward profit, but we won't, we, 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 you know, and there may be, maybe a P, per, or some some investor that comes in to, to help us take some cash off the table. But really, it's a, it, it, ideally, we, we in a perfect world, we do it through debt, you know, debt, create, create a debt fund that then pays out me and Tony and Dave some cash for our part of the journey, but we still have a chunk, decent chunk of equity in. But then we've got other directors and other key people in the business that have got a, a really meaningful chunk of change that as we go through the next few chapters of the, of the journey, that they really walk away with life-changing life changing money for them and their family. So that's the why um, from, from a kind of an IDEX point of view. The one thing that didn't resonate for me on that was we don't bring rookies into our business. And I feel guilty about that because I feel that we're not I mean, very fair, if you like, to certain group to certain groups. And so we feel that there's a, from an IDEX point of view, we're always about giving back, we're always about sharing success. And so that's why we created our million pound mission on the charity side. So we are, during that journey of getting, we're gonna make a million pound of money for charity. And the charities will be all about social mobility and you know um, protecting society ultimate, ultimately. So we don't want to just be a business that's here just to make money for the people in the business. That feels a bit too shallow for, for, for myself and Tony and Dave, but also that's been fed back by the business. You know, when we do our surveys, people really want to be putting back in. So um, we had an IDEX char charity cricket match in, uh, last week. 
which was a tremendous success. IDX won, um, <laughs> but we got 10, 10, 11, well, 11 people down from all different parts of the country all came down to my local club, actually, and we played there. And then we're doing Manchester in a couple of weeks' time and, uh, and seven ups at the end of the season. So we're doing little bits like that, which is great for, as you said, that connectivity, isn't it? When, when you're in a virtual world, when you're in a virtual world. How do you describe your job now, Matt? Like, what do you actually do? It's, uh, I'm still really hands on, to be honest, which I shouldn't be. Um, so my, everybody, you know, I keep getting told off. So, so I'm currently interim MD for the legal division at the moment uh, as well. So I've kind of gone, I'm doing what, exactly what I'm telling everybody else not to do, which is kind of go backwards. Um, but I'm, so I'm doing that at the moment while we, re, while we, um, while we scale the legal team and scale the legal team up. Um, but from my point of view, it's about empowering people to inspire and be courageous. You know, that's my job. But like, let's say, but in a more realistic, practical sense, I'm just interested in your like daily tasks at the CEO level of a 17 year old business, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like what? So, you, like you say, you're an interim MD of a legal business, which is why you were probably sat in front of a legal company yesterday or whatever, right? and you're yeah, you, you're actually running a, a business unit. So you've got leadership, like people. I like. I want to be on the top. I want to be near the top of the leaderboard. You know, I want to. You know, that's you know. So you're actually billing. You're going out there and winning business. I am, yeah, I am. Not as not as much as I'd like to. I'm embarrassed at how little it is in comparison to some of our big hitters. But um, but yeah, absolutely. So you know, once once the legal bit's done, then I still want to be income producing. So, but we we have this um, strategy which is feed, not fight. Right. So you know that kind of conundrum that people have got, where it's like, well, do we have one eighty recruiters or three sixty recruiters and this type of stuff? You know, for me. If you're a decent recruiter, you don't have enough time for BD. And if, you, if you're actually delivering a really great service to your clients and you are doing a 360 job because you're still dealing with the clients, still dealing with the candidates, you're doing that. But where do you get your time for BD? It's, it's, a, it's a horrible kind of scenario that everybody has been locked into. Well, our, our, our whole leadership team are rainmakers you know, where we bring in income to the team, into the team. Yeah. Um, and we get a share of that. Um, we get a share. We take a share of that to cover our co the, cost of do the cost of doing it. Yeah. Um, but again, these people that were historically doing 200 grand, some of that next 200, 300 grand they get is because they get gifted retained work. Yeah. Literally retained work with marketing package supporting the whole retainer. And, all, and it's just easy money, really. You know, to, you know, still got to use all your, all your recruitment skills. But ultimately, the, the job's there with candidates are marketed for you. The marketing packages are done. We do videos and, you know, do everything to make like, this the sexiest job in the world. So it's just, you know so so uh but, so yeah so but going back to your question of uh what i do i've got a great um executive team and um we have recruited the strategy and sustainability director recently um because we know sustainability is massive for our clients and we know we can we can support them with that as well um but more importantly we needed to make sure that we were doing what we needed to do for the um for society which is partly where the, the million pound missions come from um, but but Jeff's kind of brought in a lot more rigor uh, around the governance of executing the strategy. Um, so I spend my time just basically making sure the plates are spinning correctly on you know in, on with the leadership team. Right. And when you say rainmaking, it's it's reaching out to contacts, new business, all all of it. It's the classic stuff. Yeah, it's not probably less old school than. Yeah. now because we're using um technology someone told me about inbound marketing years ago i can't remember oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. some really handsome gray-haired chap that, that. that's right who seemed to look a lot older when he has a kid yeah oh, shit, yeah looking yeah. forward to that a few years time and that baby face disappears oh um, my god yeah <laughs> i think it, with this long hair i think the, the longer you go yeah the older you look that's what people have said to me and i think it's yeah. true I, like but, it. no, I think i think what we, i think what we've um, business development um, has become, it's a different world, isn't it? I mean, ultimately, a lot of the people we were recruiting for 20 years ago are now chief execs and directors of businesses. So it's not cold, there's, you know, you're not, there's no cold calling going on, really. Um, and because we've created, you know, we've created a strong brand and we've got some real unique IP as to how we do things, people want to, to listen to us. 
and then it's how then you create a sophisticated relationship with the client that uh, you know that enables you to have that kind of exclusive and retained work coming coming through and so again that's why we're in, so as leaders we're at the forefront of promoting promoting that um but the sell for stuff like that is possibly two years the timeline to convert to get a deal done which is yeah. again why if you're a fee earner can't wait to be, to be doing bd that might pay you back in two years time you can't you can't justify doing that realistically so that's so that's what we do so we really we really i think it's the most fun bit of the job as well like, i don't know I'll, i think i'll always love winning business and you know you can get people to deliver things and and i don't know the more you the more your career evolves you want to see people deliver and make get the wins but you want to absolutely you, know, you always have that yeah. desire to go out and win something and meet something. yeah but you mentioned about like when you've got 10 people in the business how do you move beyond that i think what again if it was to repeat the journey then i you, you're right you end up doing everything don't you if you're not careful yeah. um but actually you're probably only really good very good at one part of it which like you said there is probably the client side and yeah. the candidate the candidate side but you're ending up doing lots of other things and i think if you've got we didn't have the money to be able to recruit people in to do the stuff that i was crap at so so, so i do appreciate you you know it depends on how well capitalized you are when you start the business off but i, I probably would so i managed to save up about 25 grand i think it was into the bank which I knew then would pay the mortgage for a couple of a couple of years back back then, um, and so almost I had no stress attached to that. I didn't I wasn't desperate to earn any money because I knew the mortgage was paid. Louise was still working a little bit as well, so so I so I knew that we weren't going to be destitute even if I didn't bill. So that allows you then to take that medium to long term approach from the off. So that was really good. But I think that if I was to do it again, I'd, I'd probably and save double i'd have probably worked till i had double and then be able to recruit in people to support me who were quality at doing things like the operational side of things yeah. doing you know that really sat, took up a, half of my time and and so therefore i would have been more doubly successful during that period of time if i wasn't if i wasn't doing it um and now getting a marketing director in and who actually knows how to grow a marketing team Rather than us trying to grow a marketing team, not knowing what mark, you know, not, not knowing what good looks like, you know, all those things just make it so um, so much easier to continue to scale. Um, so. so I think grow, growing to a million is probably the hardest part of the journey. Growing to ten million, is, yeah, second hardest. But for some reason, I think going from ten to a hundred million feels like such an easier ch challenge than those the, those two those two challenges because. You've got the you've got the ability to to bring in brilliant people to manage the infrastructure of the of, of the business um, and to drive the the value from the database to drive the value from your marketing to drive the value from you know the data the data um, and all that type of stuff. So I think it just gets easier and easier. Love it, Matt. Absolutely love this episode. I think your approach to that medium to long term mindset. I think will benefit a lot of people. I think your attitude towards um, not having a you know too fixated goals and timelines on things again is is refreshing in our industry. I think and 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 having that patience with 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 uh, knowing what you want to achieve from a from a quality perspective and the reasons why and having the patience to see it through. You know, seventeen years is a is a is a long time. You know, and, and you, but you still feel like a you know an adolescent business, which is what you are. But it you know I, I want people to know that, that i think when you remove that it has to, i have to be a millionaire in three years i have to be this in this when you remove that that deadline you can breathe a bit and you can mm. and you just got to go out and enjoy it and it looks to me that you've enjoyed it and you, you know you've got so much energy to go to the next phase and like, i'm 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 super excited for what you you're going to do and we'll definitely get you back on in the future it might be good to get tony and dave on a triple yeah, yeah. And, uh, and see what their their take is on it. Um, if anyone does look li listen to what you've got to say and just wants to pick your brains, are you okay if they drop you a note on LinkedIn? Because that's where I'll talk you know, everything on yeah. this. Um, yeah, yeah. My, my we'll pleasure. Mate. Well, um, like I say, we'll get you on in the future. But good luck with everything and keep us updated. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And uh, likewise, Sean, appreciate your time. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. 
That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode is brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2000 recruiters right now both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level, individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn and would love to talk to you. I'll see you soon.